program on Sid Matthew. Uh, not just what he's done with his writings uh, and his collection, but what an interesting guy. What a great friend. Uh, Sid is, uh, uh, is an accomplished trial attorney as well as an author. Uh, he is a uh, proud husband and uh, father and grandfather. And if you haven't met Linda, uh, do so before you leave because she is a delightful lady and really a spark uh, behind this guy. Uh, Sid has, uh, has written two club histories. Recently, the history of Lynn Alden. Prior to that, he wrote Champions of East Lake, Bobby Jones and Friends. And these two histories are not just histories of, of two golf clubs. These are histories of, that com combine two as a history of golf in the South. Uh, and they will be recognized as history of golf in the South. Uh, he's authored 11 books about Bob Jones and about Bob Jones' utensils, as you see here. Um, he has produced two films uh, on one, the history of, of golf and the uh, Traditions of God in Scotland. He also wrote the life and time, or produced the life and time of Bobby Jones, which was uh, uh, narrated by Sean Connery, and it was shown for on five different occasions prior to the uh, Masters tournament. See, it has been the program at Augusta National. He's also been the program at St. Andrews for the Royal and Ancient Golf Club, of which he's a member. Uh, he's, uh, he's a master speaker uh, on golf and uh, both the equipment that you need and the game itself. Uh, he has written a uh, history of uh, the Tallahassee Bar. He's also uh, written about the uh, great American that uh, was, fought, was uh, famous in Watergate, uh, Chesterfield Smith. He wrote that biography. Uh, and when it's appropriate, uh, History Museum to have someone to come to talk about history because when you talk about history with Sid, his eyes sparkle. And I was going to say that his handlebar mustache straightens out, but it doesn't. <laughs> but uh, his eyes do sparkle when you start talking about the history of God. And uh, it's a great uh, uh, privilege for me to to uh, present to you my good friend and golfing buddy, Sidney Matthew. Cliff, you forgot I was a notary public. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned that to Cliff uh, as we were at the golf course yesterday. He said, I'm, I'm going to introduce you. Of course, you get real nervous when you hear that from somebody because they've got the needle and they can put it in pretty good. And he said, what should I say? And I said, just tell everybody I, I was a notary public. <laughs> uh, roll the tape if it'll roll. Uh, there's not many souls saved after 20 minutes. But I had been assured that maybe I could run over just a, a few minutes and uh, of course, uh, afterwards, if you want to buttonhole me for questions, I, I'll be very pleased to, to answer them. Thank you very much for inviting me 
uh, we prepared uh, a visual that when you get tired of looking at me, you can look at that, and then when you get tired of looking at that, you can look over here, and then you, you'll be back over there pretty quickly. I'm not trying to dovetail the two, but uh, 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 I have selected some images that uh, came to my attention during the course of putting the Glen Arden book together. And what a joy it was when uh, Cliff and uh, Bill Bridges and Joe May and, and Bob uh, Wilson and uh, our history committee, uh, chaired by Janice uh, Fairclaw, asked me to do that book. Uh, it, it was an absolute joy because of the people that you meet. It is incredible when you get involved in this. It's a people business, and you get to meet the most incredible people, and everybody's got a wonderful story. But uh, they told me, well, uh, how long will it take to do the book? I said, well, how about by Christmas? Well, by the fifth Christmas, they said, how about this Christmas? <laughs> and I, I, I just mentioned, so Winston Churchill once said, writing a book is quite an adventure. First it is a toy, then it becomes an amusement, then it becomes a mistress, then it becomes a master, then it becomes a tyrant. And about the time you resign to your servitude, you rise up and kill the monster. Books are not written, they're abandoned. So this past Christmas, we abandoned the book, and what you see is what you get. It was an 800-page manuscript, 125,000 words. Mercifully, we had an editor cut that down to 400 pages and 65,000 words. So uh, I think you can, you can thank the editor for uh, making a, a, the pain less and, and going through it. Uh, I just have time to cover the snow-capped peaks, so I'll try to go fairly quickly. Uh, you know, golf is, is uh, uh, very old. There is a uh, stained glass of a golfer in the Gloucester Cathedral dated uh, 1383. Golf is very old. Now, golf came to North America first at Montreal in the, in the late 1800s, and we had the first uh, uh, golfer in Florida, John Hamilton Gillespie, did not forget to bring his golf clubs over in 1886 when he came over to Sarasota to populate Sarasota. His father and a group of people in Edinburgh owned uh, about 40,000 acres in Sarasota. So John Hamilton Gillespie put one green at one end of Main Street in Sar then Sarasota, and one green at the other end, and he was uh, thought to be crazy as he was playing up and down the Main Street of Sarasota, the game of golf. Uh, 1883, Burlington, Iowa, 1884, Oakhurst, West Virginia, Apple Tree Gang in New York uh, in 1888, Shinnecock Hills, 1890, incorporated 1891, Chicago, 1889, and we come to Thomasville. Now, how in the world did golf get here so early? Well, the, the folks up in uh, New York uh, were, were very ardent golfers, uh, and they uh, passed the game along to the people in New Jersey. Uh, there was a fellow there named uh, uh, George uh, Washington Chapin, and Mr. Chapin was... Uh, very, very keen golfer. Uh, and he uh, met a fellow named J. Wyman Jones. J. Wyman Jones was a New York lawyer. He went to law school with Franklin Pierce, whom you'll recognize as President of the United States. Uh, he later befriended a fellow whose job was to cite all of the uh, railroad stations between New York and New Jersey. So, with, armed with that knowledge, J. Wyman Jones, very clever fellow, took the sketch stagecoach every weekend from New York to New Jersey and scouted out the property around these uh, stagecoach, these uh, railroad uh, station houses. He then bought all the property he could get his hands on and became known as the father of Englewood, New Jersey. He built Englewood, New Jersey. And he also owned St. Joe Lead Company in Missouri. He made all the lead in America. Uh, he also uh, fell in love with uh, a, a very uh, distinguished uh, lady whose last name was Hannah. Uh, her name was Salome, or Salome, whichever you prefer. Uh, and she was one of the 
magnificent Hannah family. Uh, Gertrude Hannah fell in love with a fellow named Coburn Haskell. Well, he was over in Cleveland, and Salome is marrying J. Wyman Jones in, in New Jersey, and we don't know who made it to Thomasville first. Uh, Charlie Chapin III uh, is of the view, and I, I can't disagree with him, uh, that maybe uh, his grandfather made it down here first. Uh, because Thomasville, as we know, was known as the last repository of health and salvation for those poor Yankees who needed to come down and smell that pine-scented air and swear that this was Yankee tranquility, as Tom says in his marvelous talks. But uh, Mr. Chapin uh, was uh, reported in the New York Times to be one of the top finishers in the, in the golf matches in Morristown, New Jersey, 1888-1889. He was one of the top finishers, so we know that he was an ardent golfer. Uh, he made it down, and then J. Wyman Jones made it down with his wife, and in 1888, he bought several tracts of land, uh, the uh, Seward Tract and the McIntyre Tract. McIntyre Tract uh, became El Soma Plantation, which is the anagram of Salome or Salome, uh, and uh, the Seward Tract, is Glen Arvin. Now at that time there was a, an issue raging in the uh, uh, town about creating a pleasure park uh, of some nature. They, they wanted a uh, pleasure park uh, and so the, the uh, debate was well who's going to pay for it? We know that you know the experience in New York and Chicago and Washington has been that these things are expensive. And uh, so, uh, as the debate raged, uh, J. Wyman Jones took the bull by the horns and he bought the sewer tract, about 400 plus acres, and he established uh, Glen Arvin Park. He named it after his mama, Ruth. It's been thought and published before that it was his wife, uh, but we know it wasn't his wife because uh, we, we know who she was. Uh, but his mama, Ruth Arvin, uh, is, uh, the, is the namesake, uh, and what a beautiful tract of land it was. They created uh, driving carriage routes where you could, uh, for those who have hair, you could uh, ride your, your carriage through the park and the wind would blow through your hair, and that was their form of air conditioning. Uh, Jack Kelly and I wouldn't know much about that. But... Uh, uh, he then was uh, approached by the, the uh, Thomasville Gun Club, and they had shooting there, live pigeons, uh, and then they uh, allowed some of the golfers to even show up, and they started playing golf. Now, you know, golfers are a tribe apart, and they're not very well organized. It takes some time before they're forced to get organized and then figure out how to get a clubhouse and how to pay for it. That's the last of their worries. They'd rather play than organize. Uh, and golf clubs throughout America are all the same. So the traditions of golf have always preceded the organization of the club uh, by perhaps as much as five years. That's been the experience in, in all of the other uh, early golf clubs in America, and so it was at Glen Arvin. Uh, the golfing traditions were very early uh, in, in the 1890s, uh, and then... Uh, came a time in, in 1895 when uh, the organization of golfers decided, well, we're going to change the name of the Sportsman's Association uh, to the Thomasville Country Club. And that was the, the golfers. So the Thomasville Country Club was the, was the first tradition born out of the Sportsman's Association. They then rented Glen Arvin on two five-year leases at $500 a year from J. Wyman Jones. Uh, J. Wyman was uh, not any of the worse for wear, and he was not displeased when, in about 1901, they were getting ready to renew the lease again. They said, well, a group of ardent golfers got together, and they formed Glen Arden Land Company and said, J. Wyman, why don't you just sell us the land for the golf course? Uh, which he did. The Glen Arvin Land Company then 
leased the property back to the Thomasville Country Club. Now, right around the turn of the century, we had a golf course downtown by the old high school. Uh, that lasted for, for quite a while, and uh, uh, Ryden Mays, I guess that's one of Joe's ancestors, you may claim him, uh, but he was a very skilled organizer, and he was involved with both organizations, both the Thomasville Country Club and the downtown golf course, uh, which ended up uh, going away, and the one golf course that was left in Thomasville was the Thomasville Country Club. It was nine holes, sand greens, and a fellow from St. Andrews, Scotland, Willie Stark, was the, was the first golf professional. He held the course record at 81. You can imagine. You have to erase all your footsteps after you step on the green and putt out. And they had uh, a little, uh, like a squeegee, that you use on your car to, to wash your, your car windshield, and you had to squeegee off all, all your footsteps. Uh, but it was a, a magnificent track. Uh, it went uh, counterclockwise. Today's golf course goes clockwise. The original nine holes went counterclockwise. The first hole was where the Hannah Pool House is today and extended beyond the 18th green. So it went uh, straight down toward the 10th tee, today's 10th tee. The second hole, you had to walk through the woods to get to the second tee. So uh, it then followed around a route that ended back up uh, by the clubhouse, and that was the ninth hole. Uh, in 1895, they then built uh, a rustic uh, clubhouse that had a very unique pavilion on top where you could watch all of the uh, exotic animals that Jay Wyman Jones had brought in for everybody to look at. The native deer, interestingly, would just stand there. Well, they would run into the woods. They were scary cats. But they imported these German deer that would stand there and, and, and look at you. And when they were a magnificent sight to behold. So everybody was really excited when they brought them and the peacocks and, and other exotic things in to, to look at. They even had the deer. Uh, they defanged rattlesnakes and put them in a pen, and they had the deer chop up the rattlesnakes uh, when they danced on them with their sharp hooves. So they had a lot of exciting things going on in Glen Arbor. <laughs> Reportedly, there were no lawyers in the pen at that time, but uh, uh, we, we don't have all that, uh, that, that information. But uh, in 1929, the five unforgettables of, of Glen Arbor banded together and said, now this is the heart of expression, this is the beginning of expression, uh, we're, we're going to expand the golf course. And they did. The only people who were uh, either crazy enough or, or adventurous enough to do so during that same period of time were the folks up in Augusta. But you have uh, five uh, folks. You have uh, uh, Charles Merrill Chapin, uh, the son, and you have uh, Jock Whitney, uh, Jack Archibald, J. Wyman Jones, and uh, Howard Melville Hanna. The five unforgettables. Jock Whitney, out of his own pocket, it was out of the budget. It cost seventy-five thousand dollars to build the golf course turnkey without an irrigation system, and Jock Whitney reached in his pocket and paid for the irrigation system. He was a, a, a very interesting uh, uh, research subject too, because it turned out that he kind of dovetailed in with Beatrix Hoyt. Uh, of course, there's three champions, Mary Lena Falk, uh, Jane's uh, beloved sister and a uh, fantastic golfer uh, and, a, and a wonderful person, uh, and also Francis Griscom, who won the National Amateur in 1900, uh, Mary Lena having won it in 53, and, and also Beatrix Hoyt, who won the, the uh, championship in 1896, 7, and 8. Uh, uh, ending uh, up in Marion. It turns out that her grandfather, Beatrix Hoyt's grandfather, was Salmon Chase. Salmon Chase was the Secretary of the Treasury under a man named Abraham Lincoln. Now, Salmon <laughs> Chase was the leading candidate for president with a man named Seward, who ended up 
uh, arranging for the purchase of the land now known as Alaska. But they were locked into a battle for president, and the compromise candidate was this man named Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln was a very clever man, and he knew that Selman Chase had a tremendous political following and would unseat him and during his second term, so he made Selman Chase Secretary of the Treasury. Well, Chase wanted the top flight people to work for him, and Lincoln was not going to fund that, so Chase said, I quit. Lincoln said, you can't quit. I'm going to make you Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. <laughs> and of course, he got a second term out of that. Lincoln's other secretary uh, was John Hay, and John Hay was Jock Whitney's grandfather. So you can imagine these two crossing paths in, in a very unlikely, in a very unlikely way. Uh, and uh, I uh, just kind of happened upon another uh, very interesting connection because uh, Beatrix Hoyt's uncle, I'm sorry, nephew, is still alive. He's 92. He lives up in, in Maine. And so I rang him up. He was trained as a, a PhD in Columbia, was a professor at the University of uh, New Mexico, uh, and he's sharp as a tack. He remembers everything. And he told me all about his grandmother, uh, Janet uh, Hoyt, who built the house over by 16. And next to it, her brother built a house. And uh, they then built a bridge across it so that they could walk across and play uh, Glen Arvin. Now, Beatrix put up her golf clubs at age 21. She said, I'm done, been there, done that, got the trophy. Uh, won three in a row, and she quit. But she became a real uh, accomplished artist. And her paintings are still uh, available today, and we have some of her ceramics. And, and she was, uh, she and Candace Weaver had an art colony here with Julia Wright. The Wright sisters uh, were involved in that. And, of course, you know, there's a whole other story that I, I won't go down. But, uh, but uh, Edward Hoyt, uh, told me about this whole story about his Aunt Beatrix. Uh, she had a stroke when she was 50 and was taken in by Julia Wright uh, and, and cared for uh, uh, in her later years. But uh, the legend had always been given me that Bobby Jones played here. Well, my ears perked up immediately. Tell me more. Well, Bobby Jones was here. Well, show me a photograph or show me some historical provenance. Well, we, we just couldn't quite come up with a photograph or a letter or anything. And as I am finishing a short conversation with uh, Mr. Hoyt, he said, by the way, my father played with Bobby Jones at Glen Arvin. I said, tell me more. <laughs> well, it turns out that not only were they good friends, uh, they were avid golf theorists and had written on the subject, and Jones uh, was invited by Mr. Hoyt uh, to come down and play Glen Arvin. He certainly did, and then wrote a letter of thanks, which is uh, recorded in, in the book that we have now, uh, saying one of, the, one of the most pleasurable times that I've ever spent in my life was playing golf here at, at Thomasville at Glen Arvin. Thank you very much. Signed, Bobby Jones. Now that was four months before Jones went to uh, Great Britain uh, in World War II. So you just never know who you're going to meet uh, when you're doing these things, but it's fascinating. Uh, I was telling Jack Roush, you, you can talk to anybody in three phone calls. As I was researching the golf professionals, and we had one professional named Jonathan Fovarg. Well, that's a very unusual name. <laughs> so I got a hold of some of my golf collector historian buddies, and you ever heard of Jonathan Fovarg? Oh, yeah, he's right here. He was at Skokie uh, in Chicago from 06 to 16. So I rang them up. We don't know much about him, but yes, he was here. And he left and went to Great Neck, Washington. So the next phone call is Director of Assistance, Great Neck, Washington, for Fovard. Yes, we have a Fovard right here. And the next phone call, I'm talking to Jonathan Fovard, Walter Fovard's grandson. And yes, I've got my grandfather's scrapbooks. I'll be happy to send them right to you. The first page in the scrapbook was Thomasville Country Club. There's the clubhouse. Voila. So isn't that wonderful how these things turn out? It's, it's really something. Though. 
I'm not uh, amazed. Coburn Haskell was a uh, citizen of Cleveland. He became part of Rockefeller's uh, group, uh, worked for Rockefeller, and of course the Hannas merged into Rockefeller uh, and, and, in exchange for uh, board seats on Standard Oil. And Haskell had a friend named Bertram Work, who worked at the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company in Akron, Ohio. Well, they were golfing buddies, and Coburn Haskell showed up to go play golf with Bertram one day, and Bertram said, I just got to sign some payroll checks. He said, you know, just walk around the, the shop, and I'll be with you in a few minutes. And he saw a pile of rubber windings that when you take the rubber off of the tires, they'll, they'll make long cords. And so he was just nervously rolling uh, that, that uh, winding, and he wound it into this ball, and the ball got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and he dropped the ball. The ball bounced. And there an idea was born. We're going to play golf. Golf balls are scarce. I wonder if we could use this as a golf ball. So we talked to Bertram about it, and they said, well, what about it? We'll take one of the covers off of our other golf ball. At that time, it was a Dutta Perka golf ball, which is the sap of the Malaysian sapodilla tree, and it is a uh, uh, very hard sap, but it does have some resiliency, and that you would boil it, roll it, play it, knock it out of shape, bring it home, boil it, put it in a press, and use it the next day. If you wanted to paint it, you could be kind of showy, but, you know. But they took, they took that gutta perka, boiled it, wrapped it around these rubber windings, and went out and played it. And voila, the Haskell ball was invented. And of course, Coburn Haskell came down and he was a member of Glen Arvin. He bought Winstead Plantation. And he lived at Winstead, which is the Philip Ross Plantation. So, uh, you know, these, these things uh, appear to be disconnected, but somehow they, they seem to all wind up at the same, same spot. The, uh, the clubhouse, I heard Jen Wright uh, name and uh, Mr. Jen Wright earlier, and of course they had quite a bit to do with the building of the clubhouse. Uh, we know that uh, the original clubhouse was built around 18, finished in 1895 with a spire on it, very Spartan building, and uh, they kept adding on and adding on, adding on a pro shop and locker rooms and the ballroom and and pretty soon you've got a very sprawling, uh, intriguing uh, roof line. One of the most intriguing roof lines in all of golf. All the, the British courses, Royal Elm and St. Anne's, Royal St. George's, they've all got those same historical roof lines that have been added to over the, over the generations. And Glen Arvin had one of those very classic roof lines. Uh, but in, in 1937, just at the time that, that uh, Howard Hanna had uh, provided uh, about $100,000 to build the state-of-the-art pool house. Uh, we had a fire. 1938 destroyed everything except the ballroom. The fire was so hot it caught all the pine trees around the building on fire. The forest was actually on fire as well. It was that hot. Uh, they saved the ballroom, and within the next week, there was a meeting just like this of the Glen Arvin people uh, saying, we will rebuild. And Jen Wright said, I'm there with you. And Judge Hopkins, I'll give you uh, my support. And everybody jumped in. Uh, the golfers tried to use the uh, pool house for their uh, facilities, uh, but the, uh, the golf uh, professional uh, then, Leland Cruz, uh, said, well, you know, be real careful. Why don't you dress at home? That's what he said. <laughs> you know, let's not, let's not mess up the pool people and, and their and the enjoyment of their facility. Immediately the place was rebuilt, and it was rebuilt in a fire-resistant <coughs> brick. Um, and uh, if I can be uh, uh, very uh, blunt, it looked like a, a giant Winnebago with, a, with awnings that came out of, out of the side. And uh, uh, that uh, structure burned in, in 1963 and immediately was rebuilt. So now we have the, the very uh, stately clubhouse that we have today. And 
and that is uh, just a, a thumbnail of the uh, of the building. The Piney Woods tournament started 1919, the oldest invitational golf tournament in the South. And that's an amazing statement to be able to make because there are, you have the North and South, uh, you got the Brunswick Golden Isles, you've got all of these magnificent tournaments uh, throughout the South. Uh, but the, the July 4th tournament at Glen Arvin uh, is, is the eldest invitational golf tournament in the South. Uh, they even had OB Keeler, Pop Keeler from the Atlantic Journal and Constitution come down and report on it, uh, and uh, they had a couple of his uh, cohorts uh, who were so enthralled with the Southern hospitality that, that uh, y'all provided that they just drank up about all the corn liquor they could have, <laughs> and they couldn't get any stories out of anybody. So uh, they got a guy named Furman Fisher to come down, and Furman, you know, he, he's not immune from the stuff, but at least he would do a story as well. And, uh, of course, Furman was kind enough to do the, the forward for, for our book, and, uh, and we're grateful to him for that. We had another president uh, who had a strong connection, and his secretary of the treasury, George Humphrey, owned Bilestone Plantation. And when uh, General Eisenhower became president, he came down and loved to shoot and loved to play golf, so he came down, and he... Uh, uh, enjoyed himself immensely. Uh, they had to carry him in one Constellation four propeller plane, and they had to bring the, the media in another one. <laughs> they they'd usually bring two airplanes. Uh, and the, the, the list of media, they had 54 on the list who, who came down just to cover the tournament, well, or, or, or the visit by, by Eisenhower. He landed Spence Field, and then he would motorcade uh, through uh, the town. And uh, uh, the Kellys were right there to snap his photographs, and we've got those. And, uh, and Eisenhower, uh, this, after his first term, uh, you know, he had a heart attack right before he decided to, to run for re-election. I think that was in October. And he decided, well, I'm going to go down and see if I'm strong enough to run for re-election. I want to go do some shooting and maybe play some golf and see if I can handle it. Well, he came down and he just, he had a ball. And he came over, he was, you could tell he was a little skittish. He only played nine holes the first match. Went back, played cards all night with Jock Whitney. And imagine the conversation. Now here is Jock Whitney, who has inherited this $50 million fortune which he now has turned into a mega fortune. Uh, he has purchased the uh, New York Herald Tribune. Uh, he started Greenwood Foundation for uh, uh, the victims of discrimination to provide them opportunities. He, he had his own SBA for, for, uh, for people of uh, uh, ec economically disadvantaged. Uh, he joined World War II at the same time Bobby Jones did. Neither one of them had any business going over. Jones was over D-Day plus two, and Whitney was over about the same time. Whitney grabbed one of his fellow colonels and said, let's go up to the front lines. It's a little boring down here. And so they grabbed a jeep and took off for the front lines and got encircled by a German uh, group. And they started a firefight that lasted about 45 minutes until Whitney and his other colonel buddy had run out of ammunition and were taken hostage. They were on a boxcar headed for Germany when a downed American flyer comes stumbling out of the woods, sees the boxcar, knocks the lock off, and frees Whitney. And Whitney makes it back to safety. So you can imagine uh, Eisenhower and Whitney playing cards. They probably had a few things to talk about. You know, they one of the, one of the questions that they asked Haggerty, the press secretary, uh, was the most embarrassing occasion upon which the uh, General Eisenhower remembered. And he said there was a uh, German uh, Luftwaffe jet. Uh, not, not, they didn't have jets back then. They did have them, but they weren't using them. Uh, but he 
came down to strafe Eisenhower and his buddies. And Ike was all dressed out with his medals. He was in his dress uniform uh, when the plane came down. And he had to dive into a mud puddle. And he said that was the most embarrassing time that he had during the entire war. But uh, uh, Eisenhower said, I enjoyed Glenarvan so much, uh, Haggerty arranged for another game. So they arranged for a second game, played the front nine again. He was clearly avoiding the back nine because of the 18th hole. They were walking, and he had to walk up that hole. He knew he had to walk up that hill. On the third day, he said, let's play the back nine. And he turned to Haggerty right as he is uh, going uh, up the hill, and he said, Haggerty, if I make it up this hill without any heart pain, I'll run for re-election. <laughs> now, that was a private conversation. And when I looked at all of the news reports, uh, you know, uh, it, was, it was denied. Haggerty said he never made his decision to run for re-election until he got back to Washington. Well, no one knew that Eisenhower had made a deal with the press and the Republican Party. He told the Republican Party, I won't decide whether I'm going to run until I tell you first. And he told the media the same thing. So when he got back to Washington, he then, in one day, in two meetings, in one morning, went to the Republican caucus, announced it to them, then went to the press conference and announced it to them and discharged his responsibility. Well, the problem was that, that we had always heard the story that this, this uh, decision was made right there at what we call Cardiac Hill. And, but I, couldn't, I, didn't have any, I didn't have any confirmation of it. So I had done quite a bit of research up at the museum in Abilene, Kansas, uh, where uh, all of Eisenhower's papers are. So I called her Pancrans, who's, who's, he's like Tom Hill. He knows everything there is to know about, about these subjects. And, and uh, Herb said, yeah, I seem to remember something along those lines. And he dug into it. And sure enough, 10 years later, Haggerty and Eisenhower's secretary had given oral histories and put them in the museum. And sure enough, Haggerty came clean during his oral history uh, 10 years later. I think it was uh, 68. And he said, yes, Eisenhower uh, made the decision in Thomasville. It was right there at the Cardiac Hill on Glen Arden. And his secretary confirmed that as well. So some, sometimes these things are not very straightforward uh, to, to get on the record. Uh, but uh, you'll, at least you'll know the, the whole story. And of course, uh, the Duke of Windsor, we, we knew that the Duke of Windsor had been here. He'd been hunting. We've, we have photographs of, of him on the plantations. And, uh, and we knew that he played golf. Uh, thanks to Jane, I got a hold of uh, Mary Lena's old friends, the fellow founders of the LPGA, uh, and uh, they uh, steered me over to Whiffy Smith, and Whiffy said, I've got photographs. I was there. We were on our way to a tournament, and Mary Lena said, hey, let's stop. I understand the Duke is going to be uh, in town, and we'll play golf with him, which is exactly what they did. And they took four photographs, which we have in the, in the books out here. Uh, the, unfortunately, they didn't make it into the book. They hit the cutting floor. But they're marvelous photographs of the Duke of Windsor playing Glen Arvin. They're on the 14th hole. Uh, and and uh, he has Wallace Simpson, uh, his, his wife, who he abdicated the throne for, uh, at his side. And she's walking along with him. Uh, I, I got a mixed story about her. She was an American, and of course she married Windsor. Uh, but another, one of Bobby Jones's uh, closest friends, Erie Ball, who is 95 and still hitting golf balls every day. He had open heart surgery three years ago, and Erie's back. He's the, the oldest surviving member of the original uh, 1934 Masters Theater and lives uh, down in Stewart, Florida. But I asked Erie, I said, didn't you play with the Duke one time? He said, yeah, let me tell you about it. He said, we, we took his limousine to the course. Uh, Erie was the pro of Tucson. And we, we were having a wonderful game until about the 16th hole. And then we got a message that Simpson wanted to go shopping and she needed the car. 
And he said, well, uh, you guys finish. I'll, I'll, I'll go take her shopping. And here he said, well, wait a second. You know, well, I can have one of my assistants take you, you know. Uh, you, you continue to finish the, the round. And I understood that that was uh, a very uh, hot little subject. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But it was, I got a mixed bag on Simpson. But here, they were extremely well received. And, uh, and I'll just leave that alone. The, uh, I don't know how much time we have. Do we know? I think we may be, I don't think we may be close. We're not timing. <laughs> okay. You still got another 20 minutes to take. Okay, great. I love it. The, uh, the uh, Glen Arvin uh, experience is very, very interesting when you talk to other historians because few of them have ever heard of Glen Arvin. You know, it's, uh, it really is a, a crown jewel. And uh, there hasn't been a real desire uh, on, on behalf of the folks who established it to really get the word out. I never understood that until uh, I talked to uh, uh, Charlie Chapin because he wanted to know who I was, who my horse was, how I rode in on him, uh, the whole bit, and what was I going to do. He wanted to know everything I was about because he said, look, you know, we, we don't need a lot of publicity. Uh, we don't need a lot of people knowing uh, our business. This is our sanctuary. And that is what struck me about Glen Arvin, what a, what a magnificent sanctuary it is, and what a, you know what a joy it is to step on that property, similar to Augusta. You know that is where Bobby Jones had to get away from everybody because if he played any public golf course, he would always attract 50 to 100 people. He couldn't ever have any privacy. So uh, what you have here is. Uh, what everyone else wants, and uh, and I would recommend you keep it a real close secret. It's kind of like Oregon; they don't tell you anything about Oregon, right? So uh, I wanted to to leave some time for questions too. So uh, uh, has anybody got something that they want to bring up? This, this John Whitney, I, I grew up in Long Island. He had, I think, he same on a huge estate. The Greenwood Estate, yeah. yes. Yeah. He had a huge estate in New York and, of course, uh, came down here from October to November to February, March. Uh, but he had a magnificent estate and turned the foundation into uh, a, uh, a public uh, uh, foundation that still funds... Uh, people in, in lower economic, socioeconomic classes to start up businesses and to get capital to start up businesses. When he was captured by the Germans, they said, and what do you do? He said, I'm a capitalist. Well, they kind of looked at him and they, they didn't know if he was on the square or not, but, uh, but that's exactly what he told the German interrogators. Uh, but he, that, that still, if you, if you punch it up on the internet, you'll see the Greenwood Foundation. And it's, uh, it's, it's really remarkable. They helped us with uh, the photograph of Jock in the book opening a page of the New York Herald Tribune, which was the, the newspaper that he had. How about some others? Any others? Well, listen, uh, I, I have enjoyed uh, this exercise more than you will ever know. And I want to thank Tom for... Uh, his presentations when, when we sat in this room and had Tom tell us all about the history of Thomas County uh, and Dr. Rogers, who knows more than we'll probably ever know, uh, because they're pioneering uh, in the area, uh, as well as Connie Balfour's Bob Balfour. Yes, Bob Balfour, who wrote This Land I've Loved and also a volume that I have to get back to uh, uh, to my good friends, uh, Dr. Dr. Bridges and Mary, uh, which we borrowed, and that is the history of the uh, uh, church, the Thomas County uh, Episcopal Church, just down the street on the corner, because that covers a lot of uh, the subjects that we've been talking about. They have the rights that the 
original church uh, worship services were held in the White House before they ever built the church. It, there's, you, it's amazing what you learn, isn't it? And of course, uh, Jane, uh, for uh, providing me with uh, so much information <coughs> on Mary Lena. Thank you very much, Jane. Really, really am grateful to you too. You mentioned Eisenhower and Dolph, and I uh, talked to a first-hand witness of Eisenhower's personality part of the time on the golf course. This guy worked with the Texas A&M, was a, a three-star general in the United States Marine Corps, and Eisenhower played golf at the camp in June and apparently dribbled a little pitch and went into a little stream in front of a green and was very, very unhappy. That night, the Marine Corps put in a pipe, covered over that stream, and Eisenhower had to play the next day. There was no little stream left. <laughs> well, you know, he tried the same thing at Augusta. You know, the, the tree on 17. They were in the in the governor's meeting, and Eisenhower said, "I keep hitting this tree." He said, "Trees have no useful purpose on the golf course." And he said, "I I want that tree taken down." And Cliff Roberts said, "I move we adjourn." <laughs> that was seconded, and Eisenhower's tree has has forever uh, been. Uh, been celebrated, but uh, Cliff Roberts, of course, was was uh, also a real character. He was friends with Jones and Eisenhower and, and and all those characters. And the story was that if you ever went to uh, Augusta for a, a tour, you should always ask Mr. Roberts at some point during the tour, "What time is it?" Well, one of my friends got the tour, and so he walks through the building and goes through the the, the trophy room and. Finally, they end up to the big bay window that's looking down to Ray's Creek and 17, and Mamie's cabin is over on the left. And my friend said, by the way, Mr. Roberts, what time is it? Well, Cliff reaches up and he pulls his arm up and he goes, see this watch? This is a solid gold watch. This was given to me by Dwight David Eisenhower, President of the United States. See that cabin over there? That's called Mamie's cabin. The members built that for General Eisenhower and, and his wife to, to live here and, and to enjoy this. And See that tree down there on 17? That's Eisenhower's tree. And he went through the store there. The whole point was you never got the time of day out of Cliff Roberts. <laughs> really, really, really a lot of fun. Any, anything else? Well, listen. Yes, back in the back. Oh, uh, maybe maybe Mr. Jack Kelly and his family. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the Times Enterprise. You should have with Jack Kelly. He is really something. He's a repository. He, he he was he was one of the only people who had the foresight to to recognize uh, Jackie Kennedy in a station wagon that appeared to belong to Greenwood Plantation. And can I tell the story, Jack? Is this all right? I'm not, I, I don't want to steal your thunder. Maybe you should come up and tell the story. I yield the floor to Jack. Well, let me see if I can get it right. He turns to his wife and he goes, there's Jackie Kennedy. She says, come on, Jack. This is Thomasville, what are you talking about? No, look over there. She goes, uh oh, that is Jackie Kennedy. So. Jack then calls a friend of his over at Greenwood and says, let me ask you a hypothetical question. If Jacqueline Kennedy was in Thomasville, would she possibly uh, agree to have an interview and maybe a photograph made if she were in town? And his friend said, I don't know anything about what you're talking about, but I'll get back to you. <laughs> so he called me back and he said, if... Jacqueline Kennedy were in Thomasville, no, she would not be interested in an interview or having a photograph made, but if on Sunday morning, if you'll be at the Catholic Church at 10 o'clock, I'd recommend that you be there. And so Jack was there and took the photograph that went around the world of Jackie Kennedy coming out of the church here in Thomasville. And of course, she used Thomasville as a sanctuary at the important times we know uh, that she had to go through uh, at the uh, as a guest of the Whitney's. So that was their connection. Of course, she was uh, very interested in, in publishing.
and was a, a literary uh, editor, as we know. How about some others? This is fun. <laughs> well, well behind you. That's the picture. Too. Oh, exhibit A. <laughs> <laughs> now, I just two more minutes. Uh, I brought with me some garden tools. <laughs> Golf started. Uh, very early, and it started with the golf ball. A top hat full of feathers were boiled, and there was a leather case made, sewn, and it was sewn like a baseball, and the feathers were stuffed into it, and when the weather got dry, it contracted, and the weathers got, when the feathers got dry, they expanded, making a very hard ball. And, of course, whether the shepherd turned his crook round and hit a rock into a rabbit scrape and turned to his friend and said, I'm the only one who could ever do that. No, give me that. I can show you I can do it. And the game is on. We don't know about that. It's buried in history. But uh, we do know that the, uh, all of the golfing implements were made uh, to hit that feathery golf ball. And they were made out of all kinds of uh, materials, Thorn, beech, uh, very hard uh, apple, whatever oak, whatever woods could be made. And instead of drilling a hickory shaft all the way through, there was actually a shaft that was wound with pitched linen whipping to hold it together. Not an altogether sturdy device, but it certainly worked. And you can see how long this one was made around the Civil War. Uh, and it has... Uh, uh, the Prince of Wales feathers on it. Uh, this is the Wales Windsor. The, this is Windsor's grandfather that we're talking about. Uh, but uh, then uh, uh, Professor Patterson from the University of St Andrews uh, was an Egyptologist, and you know the British are very fond of desolate places, and uh, he arranged to have a mummy brought from Egypt, uh, whether it had the appropriate papers we don't know, but of course, you know, a lot of those artifacts got away. And they wrapped this mummy in this sap of the Malaysian sapodilla tree. They made it soft and put it on the mummy, shipped it to St. Andrews, and he peeled off the sapodilla, the gutta perca, and threw it in the corner, threw it in the corner, and uh, put, took his mummy and put it in the museum. Well, his clerk, clerk, uh, was a keen golfer, and he was also fortuitously out of golf balls. Uh, and uh, he was an honest kid; he didn't want to steal one. But he saw this stuff over here, and he said, "I wonder if I can make a golf ball out of that." And so he carved it, boiled it, took it out, hit it, and found that it ducked in flight. It was round, perfectly smooth had no aerodynamic properties on it. Uh, and then he mishit it a bunch, playing it, and all of a sudden he found that it flew, which gave him an idea, and he went home, boiled it, formed it, and then took a knife and started cutting it. And he ended up with a golf ball just like this, and they even put paint on him, and those golf balls were extremely hard and flew about 20 or 30 yards further than the feathery golf ball did. Well, Alan Robertson was the first professional of the golf uh, club at St. Andrews, and he had the corner to market on feather golf balls. Uh, you could make about three a day, and they were very expensive, and only the, the, uh, the landed gentry could afford them. Uh, but uh, old Tom Morris, uh, was his apprentice, and he was making featheries for, for Alan. And Tom was out playing golf one day, and he ran out of golf balls, and the guy he was playing with us said, well, Tom, I've got one of these new gutties. Would you like to try it? And he looked around, they were out on the loop, and Alan wasn't around, so he said, sure. And he played it, and you could hit it about 180 yards instead of 160 with a feathery. So Tom was just having a ball with it, Alan came out of his shop as Tom came up 18, and he saw him playing with one of those golf balls and fired him on the spot. Tom had to go to Presswick for a few years and hide out. 
but he became a great exponent of the of the gutta perca golf ball. And of course, the feathery uh, went away because the gutta perca came into play. The problem was it was so hard that those long clubs it would smash them, it would break them. Because when you got when you have two pieces that are just spliced together, it just busts them off, or else the head would bust off. So what happened is they they started making the club head much smaller. They made it to look like a Scottish bath called a biscuit. If you took a Scottish biscuit and just put a stick on it, that was what the shape was supposed to look like. And so the evolution became from the feathery and the long nose uh, play club to the gutta perca and the bulger or the bat. And then Colburn Haskell revolutionized golf. This fellow, uh, who was a member of Glen Arden, is known as the father of the revolution of golf throughout the world. In Great Britain, you can walk into the, to the, the golf club of St. Andrews and mention Colbert Haskell. Aye, lad! Mm. They, they, know, they know exactly who you They'll buy you a dram. Uh, and, uh, and then you, you had uh, the uh, Haskell uh, with the rubber bands on the inside, which now has been evolved over into the two piece or one piece or however many pieces you want to have. But the, you know, Bobby Jones uh, could only play one of those rubber band golf balls for about three or four holes because he, would, he hit it so hard he would break the rubber bands inside the ball and it would become real gnarly. And we have some of those uh, here if you want to you look at them. But we have, uh, forgive me, I, I left my uh, feathery in the museum up in Atlanta, but we do have uh, the uh, gutta perca and we also have the Haskell for you to look at. And we've got the uh, uh, feather ball clubs, uh, we have the uh, BAP, the Bulgers. They also, early, they had smooth faces to hit a feather ball. And once again, they noticed that if you put scoring or marks or punch dots or something like that, that it would control the ball. You could keep the ball on the club head just a fraction of a second longer to control it and to compress the ball a little bit better. And so we have clubs up here that you'll see where they're hand-hammered marks, uh, turn of the century, which would have been uh, the ones that they played at Glen Arden. Which leads me to the last story, and I promise I'll quit. At the Piney Woods, a, a few, just a few years ago, there was a fellow who was over on 18, and he sliced his second shot, and it was over on the right, it was kind of muddy, clay mud, and, and he saw a little, looked like a ball in the mud. So he took his knife out and dug it out, cleaned it off, washed it off, and it was a it was a, an 1880s gutta perca golf ball found right there, which would have been to the right of the number of the, the original sand green number one. <coughs> That's where it would have been. So somebody in the late 1880s uh, sliced a shot, and you know uh, this fellow was the beneficiary of it, which. Uh, leads me to the to the point that uh, we should pass a rule that say you can't remove any antiquities from the club anymore without the permission of the governors. <laughs> any other uh, questions? Back in the back. Uh, as luck would have it, we have a copy of the ring, the wedding ring for Wallace Simpson. Anybody else? Thank you very much for your Bowls. 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 Hey, how you doing? Bowls. Bowls.